Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Please remain standing for the national anthem, which we will all sing. seated. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for joining us tonight for another installment of Conversations with the Prime Minister. We are broadcasting live from the Mount Hope, Mount Lambert Community Center this evening. Those of us here tonight are adhering to all the COVID-19 protocols. While we've restricted the numbers at this venue, we want to ensure you have an opportunity to interact with the Prime Minister. You can join the conversation by sending your questions to convos with the PM at gov.tt. Let me spell that out, C-O-N-V-O-S, with the PM at gov.tt. Be sure to include your name and community. Please allow me now to hand over to the Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, our Master of Ceremonies for the evening. A very good evening to those of you who have joined me in this building, and a very good evening to Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are following us on the various platforms and media. Permit me to uh, acknowledge in my presence here this evening the Minister of Education, this is uh, Nian Gatsby Dolly, our colleague, our colleague, the Minister of Health, Member of Parliament for St. Joseph, is Terence Dehal Singh. And we have here with us the Member of Parliament for Tunapuna, who is our Deputy Speaker in the Parliament. And we have the Minister of Communication. Is there another minister behind there? Oh. We have the Minister of Communication here overseeing our proceedings, and I gather we're going live on TTT. A good evening, TTT, and good evening to all of you who have taken the time to come here. This evening is a conversation with a little bit of a difference in that I would like us to focus our interest and our attention on two areas of governmental activity, governmental responsibility, national concerns, which have been uh, attracting the attention of virtually every household in Trinidad and Tobago, and therefore, we expect to be here for two hours. We expect to be here until 10 o'clock. And um, I'm sure that there will be enough in the two areas. One, health, COVID, vaccines, and the other, education, school, school children, scholarships, bursaries, and of course, all that goes with that. But let me assume the responsibility of saying to you here, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we have a lot of challenges that we face on a daily basis. Sometimes I try deliberately
to be a little quiet so that the rah-rah, the janjat, doesn't get too high and doesn't become too disturbing. But it's not that there's something to hide. I mean, if I could, every single day I tell you everything I do, everything that goes on in the country. But some of it sometimes require um, a little patience for it to work out so that the story could be a little more enlightening when it does get to you or a little um, more concerning. In that intervening period, if you want to call it a vacuum, it's filled by other people, many of whom are part of today's uh, style. And that, that would be an issue for a whole night. I want to spend one night sometime soon talking to you about this era of the big lie. There are a lot of people who nowadays have taken the position that they could tell you anything if that is going to carry the narrative, if that is going to suit their agenda, and it matters not that it is not true. So we, at the level of the government, and I guess you at the individual level, spend a lot of time fact-checking what comes to you, and of course in government debunking daily doses of misinformation, misleading in, uh, actions of one kind or another, and outright lies. And if you, some of it might be humorous, some of it might be annoying, and, but some of it is quite dangerous. And if you're not careful, you could find yourself being led by a deliberate dose of untruths. But we, for the last year, this is March, we are in mid-March, just about a year since we have had to lock down our country. Because um, by January of 2020, we had begun to respond and prepare very seriously to face a pandemic. None of us in this room has ever faced a pandemic before. No government in our lifetime has ever had to govern this country in a pandemic. But I tell you what this government has had to do. We have had to struggle with a collapsing economy in 2015, because our economy started to go off the rails in 2014 because of external forces on our revenue. By 2015, we were in some serious difficulty. But when the pandemic came in 2020, the biggest problem that the government of Trinidad and Tobago faced was to take responsibility for this population so that when the pandemic was over, you would still have jobs, you would still be alive, you would still have your children to go to school, you would still have as much of the life that you had when the pandemic was declared. And therefore, as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, my primary responsibility, notwithstanding whatever the consequences are, my primary responsibility was to lead the cabinet to protect the lives of our citizens and the livelihood of our citizens. We have had to do a lot of things, not the least of which was to fund tens of thousands of households, failing which a lot of people in this country would have been starving. There were a lot of households in this country when we had to shut the country down, say stop, Remember when we had that um, prayer service at the Prime Minister's residence? I read a verse from the book of Isaiah, a few, a few lines, and it was all about withdrawing for a moment to let this evil pass. That's, that's when we shut our country down. People shut down their businesses, but we still took chances and kept certain aspects of our economy open. We never shut down the energy sector. The essential services stayed open. The health services were all there. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, where we are today, for the actions that we've taken, two things have happened. One, we have incurred a lot of debt to fund 
a lot of the support that went to the households across this country. Of course, you can find people who will tell you, I didn't get my house, I didn't get my grant, and I didn't get this, and I didn't get that. But for every one of those here saying that, there are tens of thousands who are silent saying, I got it. And maybe they were saying, I'm grateful that my country could have provided that. Don't sell our country short. I know there are voices who would be telling you this is the worst place and the worst thing and the worst government. But you know the richest country in the world is America. They print their own money. The US dollars, that the forex that we're fighting for, the US dollars we work for, they print that. They have a press that runs nonstop just printing it. It is only last week that that government, the richest government in the world, passed a bill in their parliament produce and give to its people the kind of support that we gave you in March of last year. Uh, March of last year. <laughs> and if you take the fact that they have just said recently that they intend to register Venezuelans, you might want to think that maybe they're following everything Trinidad and Tobago does. <laughs> but they've just printed and distributing, and they are now about to distribute in America, almost two trillion dollars just to support people, keep them in their homes from being evicted, keep them in with food. You would have seen the long lines, miles long of people going for, for food, people who had good jobs. In a matter of two weeks or a month, found themselves not being able to feed themselves in the richest country in the world. The British government abandoned their budget and borrowed almost five billion pounds as a result of trying to respond to this COVID. The closure of the border has shut down a significant part of our economy. That had been the most irritating part of our response because there are some people who try not to understand why we're doing it, and there are others who see opportunity to make political money more over it, but the bottom line is, it was an important part of our response to COVID. So, we survived the year. We did more than survive. Except for some restrictions in the service, the food service trade, where we um, not allowing alcohol in certain conditions, in seated arrangements or in standing arrangements at bars. Bars are still open, but they're not allowed to have it do the usual barring thing. You go and line by the bar and congregate because the one thing that worked for us and works for everybody in this virus fight is don't congregate because you have to assume that every one of us is a carrier of the virus. And certainly every one of us could be a receiver of the virus. So this separation is an integral part. And that is why we said, yeah, you can buy beers, you can buy drinks in the bar, but you can't congregate to drink it. We prevented you from doing a lot of things where congregation was the physical aspect of it. And as the virus levels got lower and lower, we allowed you a bit more and more coming out, coming out, until as we approach Christmas, we were one of the few countries in the world who said, if after Christmas and New Year's, our numbers are the same and those festivities do not result in some explosion in our numbers, we will bring some of our children out. Tonight, I want to congratulate all those who prepared the school system, who for the last month or more, we brought out our senior students they are at school, so in Trinidad and Tobago, some children are at school. Those who are having to prepare for exams and who are having exams. And of course, we said by April, meaning after Easter, because the first week of April is Easter week, right? By April, if things remain the same or better, we will bring some of our other students out. And I think our primary school children are likely to come out once we are in that situation. So, we are among the few who are able to do that. Right here in our Caribbean region. Uh, there, there are some people on the media in the country who give me advice every day. 
telling me, do it like Barbados, do it like Jamaica. Why can't be like Barbados? Why can't be like Jamaica? Of course we love to be like them when things are going well. But then, when things are going badly, they remain silent. Because right now, some of our Caribbean neighbors are having some serious challenges. Some challenges which we face and some which we did not face. Because one, one that we did not face, we set out as a yardstick to measure our position by saying that we always want to be in a position to provide health care for any citizen who is afflicted by this virus and requires additional health care outside of the normal health system we have in the country. Because we had our parallel health care system, we call it parallel health care system, some people disparage it, but the important thing was we had a line that we attended to COVID people separate and apart from the normal health care for the population. And we said, we want, no matter what happens to us, we want to be in a position where we will always be able to provide health care to persons who may require, especially if that health care is hospitalization. And I could say tonight, congratulations to the health department in Trinidad and Tobago. We kept that word. Because we have never been in a situation, knock wood, where we had people who were sick with COVID in this country and could not find adequate health care. Some countries far better off than we are financially and otherwise. There were lines of ambulances outside hospitals looking for a place, many being turned away after half a day with a patient on board. We didn't get to that situation, thank God. But let me say something to you here in Trinidad and Tobago tonight. Doesn't matter what you think about how good the situation is and what is happening to you personally. The virus and its threat, the pandemic, are not over. We are still in a pandemic. Do not, for one minute, believe that because we have not experienced the worst or a very bad situation that for us the pandemic is over. That is exactly when we drop our guard, stop doing the things that we have done to get us in this situation, and overnight the pandemic would be expressed in this country in a way that it had not been expressed before. So you stop wearing your mask, you start a party, you're ignoring the, the uh, sanitize, sanitizing and other things. We could easily become infected or reinfected. And I want to say, having said that, that God forbid, if we find ourselves in a situation again where the response is to lock down the country. You see what's happening in Italy? They have to lock down the country afterwards, what, almost a year? After about a year when you think that well, the pandemic had passed, into lockdown. Very many European countries are now into lockdown, some for the third time. When you go into lockdown, remember what happened in May, in, in, in April, in March of last year? Somebody has to fund that because if there is no money to pay for the lockdown because people are not going, a lot of people, will not be going to jobs. A lot of businesses will not be able to carry their staff and pay them for coming to work. We have pretty much used up what wiggle room we had to fund support in the way that it was funded last year. And if you think if we get back into that situation, we will find the resources to fund it again. I'm putting this country on notice, the resources are not available. Not available. With the best will in the world, we will not find money to give 50 and 60,000 people a paycheck every month for three months. So it is easier, cheaper, better, and it is absolutely essential that we keep our personal responsibility going, respect the threat that is facing us, and not find ourselves having to go into a lockdown. But on the other hand, no lockdown, low numbers, low infection rates, 
and our children come out to school. Our manufacturing sector is open. After a period of lockdown, people came out. The, the whole economy in terms of the, those who do things and had a workplace and the business place survived because quite a few businesses, small business in particular, did not survive because the owners could not fund the, 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 the hiatus. And even with the government support to keep the staff fed and, and safe, many business owners could not carry the debt that the pandemic placed on their shoulder. And therefore, when we opened up the economy, many doors remained closed. But of course, very many doors remained open and we kept people on, at work. And in fact, the Minister of Trade will tell you that in 2020, one of the best performing areas in the country in the economy was the manufacturing sector. We did pretty well, even during that pandemic year. So as a country, we are now at the stage of wanting to come out into the light. And that light was held out to us as uh, the arrival of news that the world's scientists, the world's biologists have found an efficacious vaccine, a vaccine that could deal with the virus. If you put it into a human body, the human body is not infected to sickness by the vaccine, but it triggers the body to make a response that will treat with the virus if the virus comes into you as a live pathogen. So everybody gets anxious. Everybody gets anxious and is ready. We are all ready. We've been, we've been locked down from that, that standpoint for a year. As soon as the, vaccine, the first vaccine was approved, everybody wanted to be vaccinated or to vaccinate their country because of the benefits that go with that. And I'm not here talking about the, 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 the portion of people who say that vaccine is bad and they wouldn't take it. I'm talking about the majority of people who have experienced vaccines in their lives and know the benefit of the vaccines. And of course, who rely, who rely on the WHO to monitor the product using all the scientific measurements and observations and reviews and say to the world's population, this vaccine is approved for use in this way. The first one came out, and even before it came out, those of us who are in leadership position in the world, and here I'm talking about CARICOM, knew that there could be a very bad problem. And the bad problem is this, that nobody was going to go and stockpile millions and millions and hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine before some approval was given. Because if no approval was had, that would have been billions lost. But the minute the vac a vaccine was approved, we were fearful that those who had weight in, in all its form, big country, influential politically, have money, have big and heavy friends, and of course, even control within your border, those who will make the vaccine, that such countries will grab what was available for their people and others who did not have those attributes will not get. So uh, 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 an understanding was made where about 150 countries in the world agreed that all of us will make prepayments before a vaccine was had to an arrangement called the COVAX where you make your payment, there was an agreement, an indicative price for this product. And when the vaccine becomes available, a portion of it will come into this COVAX and be distributed to a hundred and something countries that were part of this. That was the way of getting equity, where because you have more money, doesn't mean you can have all the vaccine. Because you have a big population doesn't mean that you'll vaccinate all of your people before somebody else gets a vaccine. We were afraid of that. And the COVAX idea was the world's response. And we are a part of that. And the commitment from COVAX was what, 20 or 30 percent? 20 percent? 25? 
20% of the population would come from the COVAX. That automatically means that you will have to get 80% from in the open marketplace, from the manufacturers, from wherever. But COVAX was going to give you 20%. And that 20% was meant, as the minister would have said over and over and over, first and foremost are frontline health caregivers, the most exposed. Those people who are advanced in Asia were also most exposed with comorbidities. And of course, you work it downwards into the healthcare population. So it is always an expectation that we'll have to look outside of that 20% for additional vaccine. But the expectation was that the world supply would have been such that you could buy the vaccine from manufacturers as they were approved. So after the first vaccine was approved, AstraZeneca, I think it was, right? There was a rush for it. But we, those of us in the COVAX expect that our 20% of whatever is produced will be there to be distributed. That didn't happen. And at CARICOM, we had a CARICOM heads of government meeting early in the year. And because we were monitoring this on a virtual daily basis, we realized that something terrible could happen. And CARICOM at his first meeting of 2021, where incidentally Trinidad and Tobago was in the chair, issued a statement calling for support of the COVAX mechanism and asking that this whole question of heavier countries, wealthier countries cornering the supply not do so to the detriment of smaller countries across the world. That was a CARICOM position in January. By February, vaccines, another one or two companies came under Pfizer and internally Moderna. Well, that Johnson & Johnson came very recently, the most recent. But by February, we had two going on three. And of course, there were many people around the world who were producing vaccines. But from, for, from all practical purposes for us, and speaking as your prime minister, for all the people of Trinidad and Tobago, the only vaccine that will come into this country and go into your arm is a vaccine that is approved by WHO, otherwise it could be dangerous. So no amount of vaccine being produced or available anywhere is of importance at a time when it is not approved. Of course, as the minister will tell you when I call him up here, Mr. Callum says, Minister, come join us, and Minister, help. Minister, come join us here. When they tell you the details, when he tells you the details, even before vaccines have been, have been approved, certain companies were being highlighted as the ones who are nearer approvals. So conversations would have started with them. But they too couldn't go too far in the conversation because one, they didn't know they're getting the approval, two, they didn't know the price, and if they know the, if they know the price, they're not telling you, and three, it was an era of great profit. Immediately, immediately, Approvals were granted, vaccines became unavailable. Here in the Caribbean, especially if you listen to Trinidad and Tobago media and the opposition in Trinidad and Tobago, you'll get the impression that Caribbean countries are vaccinating their population. That's a phrase being used here in the Caribbean, in, in Trinidad and Tobago. Caribbean countries are vaccinating their population and only Trinidad and Tobago is not doing so. What is the truth in that? The truth is that the only vaccine that has come into our region, the only vaccine that has come into our region, uh, a small number of doses that came into Barbados, into Dominica, and a bit later on, some to Jamaica, and well, Antigua might have had some by now. What is the story there? What exactly is, what exactly happened there? And talk about misinformation. I am being accused in Trinidad and Tobago of not moving to get Trinidad and Tobago's share of some 500,000 vaccines that are available to us from the government of India. Because a lot of people in this country, either by ancestry or by political persuasion, have taken it upon themselves to be mouthpieces for the government of India. 500,000 vaccines available and Trinidad and Tobago is not moving to get it and accusing us of all manner of evil. What is, the, what is the truth of that? As chairman of CARICOM, as head of CARICOM, I can tell you without fear of contradiction, 
There's nothing anybody could show you in this region, at CARICOM or elsewhere, that there's only 500,000 vaccines available. A couple of weeks ago, I was chairing the CARICOM meeting here in, from here in Trinidad. We all we were virtual. And after all this beating up upon, on the government and myself and CARICOM for whatever, I asked all my colleagues, heads of government, the entire CARICOM who was in the meeting, does anybody know or does anybody have seen a document or has spoken to anybody from India about 500,000 vac vaccines? Answer is no. Not one CARICOM head in that meeting could have said, I've seen an email, I've seen a letter, not the CARICOM secretariat, not a prime minister or, or, or chief minister anywhere in the region. Where did that, where that came from? Where did that come from to become such a pillar of Trinidad and Tobago's conversation? It came from the CARICOM secretariat, which for some reason, and I have not found out the reason how come, but a tweet came out from the CARICOM secretariat thanking and congratulating India for supplying 500,000 vaccines to us. Yesterday, I had, in response to questions to the CARICOM Secretariat, in the context of this Trinidad story and elsewhere about 500,000 doses, this is the answer from the CARICOM Secretariat. The same Secretariat that sent out, somebody must have heard it said, somebody in authority said it to somebody in CARICOM and a tweet went out thanking for this vaccine. And of course, it landed in Trinidad and all hell break loose. This is the Secretary General speaking to the Chairman of CARICOM. I have not received any written communication on India's donation of vaccines to the region. The first I heard of it was media reports that Dominica and Barbados were about to receive a donation. About two days later, the Indian High Commissioner in Guyana is reported in the Guyanese media to have said that 500 doses of AstraZeneca would be made available to the region and that Guyana, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis, the countries to which he is accredited, would receive donations. So this appears to be the source of that story. Guyana, Antigua, St. Kitts, Nevis. They have one and the same Indian High Commissioner, the one in Guyana. And they talk the story. And next thing he told me, I saw the media reports and, to, and sought to inquire about arrangements that were being made for donation to the region. He, the High Commissioner, informed me, the Secretary General, that the arrangements were bilateral and each high commissioner would be responsible for the countries to which he or she is accredited. So the Ghanaian high commissioner, who is responsible for St. Kitts, Nevis, and Antigua, had the story. It landed in Trinidad from the media and from that particular tweet. And it was being said that these vaccines are available to us in CARICOM as a CARICOM gift from India, and Trinidad and Tobago is not taking part in receiving it because the Prime Minister doesn't want Indian vac vaccines, and of course, I'm one member of parliament is on hand side saying, I'm snubbing India, and all of a sudden, the issue is no longer Trinidad and Tobago and small countries being left out of the vaccine market and availability. But in Trinidad and Tobago, it became an issue of race. Those of you who heard the Prime Minister, the, the, the opposition leader last Monday night would have known how disgraceful that performance was. Because I made reference to something called vaccine apartheid. It wasn't my phrase. I was simply quoting a phrase that came out of England. 
where reporters in England were talking about vaccines only being available to the rich white countries of the north of the world and not being available to the small countries elsewhere in the world. And they called it vaccine apartheid because only certain people were getting it by certain attributes. The opposition leader gone crazy attacking me and defending her ancestry, which I somehow I'm accused of being all of that, all of that is the big lie that you're being asked to believe. A simple, straightforward matter. What is, what is the truth? Simple. No 500,000 doses of vaccine available. Secondly, no documentation. Nobody ever, ever said that. And that was a creature of media personnel, personnel who but we have an ambassador here in Trinidad to be from India. If you are required, as happened with Guyana and the other smaller islands, to know about this, then we should know about it here. And there's a pathway. But, but you know what was happening in Trinidad and Tobago? The first I heard about any vaccine from India, I heard about it from local doctors who was spoken to by the Indian High Commissioner, who did not speak to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The second I heard about it was from Trinidad and Tobago businessmen who were seeking to make arrangements to bring vaccine into the country. Our foreign minister then approached the commission here to find out what is this story awash in the media, editorial and front page cover, what is it all about? I don't know. Well, we then did what we're supposed to do. We communicated directly with India to find out if this was available. And if it was, well, we were willing to participate. I can tell you, there has been no confirmation of any such thing from India. We also, contrary to what they're saying, that we don't want Indian, Indian produced vaccines, we also communicated with the supplier from India who is supplying the world and says, we're not taking any orders. What is happening is that the vaccine suppliers have taken pre-orders from the wealthy countries that are buying up all that they can produce. And in that environment, a lot of charlatans have hit the road with their carpet bags coming to offer you vaccine because you, you as a sovereign country can't get it but they can get it for you. And we've had approaches. One person wanted 1.4 million US dollars as a finder's fee to get us vaccines. 1.8. 1.8 million. I've had CARICOM colleagues tell me, look, I'm onto a million vaccines here, but I, I could only use X amount. Um, can, would you take the rest? And my question is, where is that coming from? How do you know it is good vaccine? Who is gonna sell you water in a syringe as vaccination? Because already the world news is telling you that there are fraudulent vaccines in the market already. And of course, you were hearing in Trinidad and Tobago that the reason why we're not getting vaccine is because, is because we are playing the groundwork for friends of ours in the, in the, in the local business community, party finances to bring in the vaccine. What is the fact? The producers of vaccines outside of Trinidad and Tobago where they didn't produce, have told the local agents here, don't bother, you are not required. There's no local agent in Trinidad and Tobago. Even though there are local agents for the companies making the vaccine, they have been excluded from the supply. So COVID-19 vaccines are probably the only medication or, or medical um, material that is not available on the market to the agents who are agents for the people who, are, who make it abroad. Because, of course, they control the market to make the most money out of it. They don't need local agents. Demand far outstrips supply. And there is not one Caribbean country today who has been able to buy a single dose of COVID vaccine. So this is not a Trinidad problem. It's not even a CARICOM problem because 130 countries in the world today have not got a dose. 10 countries have got 75% of what has been produced so far. 
Understand? The only paid for vaccine that has come in here, 14,000 doses that have gone to Jamaica, and you probably know why. Those came through the COVAX, and the COVAX had a, an upfront payment of some kind, and therefore you could say that you, you know, that's the only vaccine that's coming here paid for so far. A few of our Caribbean neighbors have got gifts, and of course, when you go to somebody, when you go to somebody asking for a gift, that is not a gift, you're begging. Understand that. There was no arrangement for us here in Trinidad to be able to vaccinate this population by begging. There was an arrangement put in place with power and, of course, WHO, and, of course, the world's trading and making of vaccines. That system is now in deep, deep disarray because of the behavior of human beings to other human beings. Those who have money, they have taken the position that until we vaccinate all of our people, none of the vaccine that we have cornered will be made available. I know CARICOM colleagues who have asked XYZ countries who shall remain nameless for vaccines because they had problems and have been told, no, we can't give you. Because if we give you, we'll have to give the others. Understand? So where are we right now? We are at the stage where we were told maybe we'll get vaccines at the end of January. That is when the COVAX had looked like it was going to work and work early. Then January came and went. Then we told maybe towards the end of February and everybody's waiting. Then we told we'll get by the, uh, in fact, I, I was at one time, I was given an exact date. 22nd of March. When I did not get vaccinated out of the 2,000 that came from Barbados, I was told and I agreed I could wait until the 22nd of March. That's next week. As I speak to you now, we have no confirmation that on March 22nd we're going to get vaccines. What we do have, while the minister was telling you yesterday, while he was on the phone, while he was in the, in, in the, in the usual media That's conference, cool. telling you about our understanding of the 33,000 doses we're expecting, I was in my contact with WHO, which telling me, it appears as though we will not be able, in the COVAX, to deliver even that. It will be less. And of course, the schedule for the Caribbean, for CARICOM, the numbers are there. As of 48 hours ago, those numbers were significantly reduced. It might very well be that Trinidad and Tobago might still have 33,000 doses, but many of our colleagues have had their numbers reduced. And we are still, we are still on track to receive our first COVID, COVAX vaccines by the end of March, which is not too far away. And of course, not being able to confirm a shipment now is making us believe that COVAX has not been able to access. Our particular problem in Trinidad and Tobago is that COVAX assigned Trinidad and Tobago's supply to the AstraZeneca maker in Korea. And that company has fallen far short of the volume that it was anticipated to make. The Korean, our, our first doses is coming from the AstraZeneca, Korea. And their shortfall, their shortcoming, is what is causing some significant delay in our area. And of course, we have been talking to other people, and I'll let the minister talk about that, because he's um, the Minister of Health along with um, Foreign Affairs. They have been dealing with that. But so basically, people of Trinidad and Tobago, we are part of a world problem. However you slice it, however you dice it, vaccines are not available for purchase. Some very small CARICOM countries and some who are in desperation have had small favors from one country, small volume from one country. Nobody else has given us anything. As head of CARICOM, 
I have written as, a, as CARICOM chairman on the 4th of March, CARICOM wrote to the Prime Minister of the UK, Prime Minister of Canada, Prime, the President of the United States, pointing out the problem that we as a region are facing. To date, Canada has indicated that they are giving um, close attention to what we have said. That's the only response we've had so far. I don't know what that means, but what we do know is that the bulk of what is available, and you know, there's something called inelasticity in economics, and that means that if something has to be used for a particular purpose, and only that something is or is not available, then you are in this inelastic situation. The only thing that you can use for COVID vaccine is COVID vaccine. So if there's no COVID vaccine available for purchase, then anybody offering you anything else, you have to be careful. This government cannot be too careful because I tell you something, you could imagine if in order to please the impatience in this country, we go and allow some charlatan to take our money to get vaccines for us. And then of course can't deliver. You know what happened in America? At the height of the COVID problem a few months ago, the American government with all its agencies and all its checks and balances, a little fella take $34 million from the American government, 34 million US dollars to supply N95 masks. He got arrested about three or four weeks ago. Didn't have a single mask. Sold the American government $34 million of masks. Got to be careful. There's one country that has bought a whole shipload of counterfeit vi um, vaccines. vaccines. You understand the environment? Your government is a responsible government. We've taken you through this storm. We've taken you for a year through a pandemic. And there are people who will have you believe that coming to the tape of vaccines, that is when the government suddenly become incompetent and stupid. Well, if we had been what they're saying we are, we would have treated you with hydroxychloroquine and bleach. We would have prescribed bay rum, white rum, and lime, punching and lime. We would have sent you all into the Queen's Park Savannah, into the sunlight, and all of you would have been involved building the dome. But while all that advice was being given to us, we were following the science and taking firm governmental decision based on the advice of our health department. So today when you hear there isn't a single report of an infected person in Tobago, it is not by accident, it is by design of the staff and the government and the healthcare delivery in Tobago. Next week, the end of next week, we move into Easter. And of course, this is not, this is not an Easter that the story is going to be the fairy, the fairy, the fairy, the fairy. This is going to be an Easter where anybody who wants to go to Tobago can go and come back when you want. So you know what's happening now? Tobago is almost full and overflowing. The place to be is in Tobago. And I tell you, the best vacation you can have at home in Trinidad and Tobago is in Tobago. Go to Tobago if you want, but when you go there, behave yourself. Behave yourself. We are in a pandemic. Wear your mask. Stay away from crowds. No partying. And so on and so on. And you can have a wonderful Easter in Tobago. Nobody asking you to go to sea and be in the mask on your face. But when you come out of the water, before you go to anybody, put on your mask and everybody's going to be all right. And that, for me, is the success of the people of Trinidad and Tobago in whom the government places confidence. I wish I could tell you tonight that we will get our vaccine. There are people in the parliament asking me, when are we going to get our vaccine? I am in the same position as you are in the parliament. Our country is part of a world system. Our country is part of a system with demand with no supply available to us. And of course, 
all these lies and stupid talk about vaccine available and who didn't get and who's getting and so on. I just told you what the facts are. Just told you what the facts are. And we have been making every effort, but we are expecting to get our first shipment of a few tens of thousands from the COVAX. And that, and that was the first tranche. And of course, we expect a second and a third tranche going into the middle of the year. And by the end of the year, much of what I just mentioned here is going to be behind us. Unless, of course, we end up in situations where there are mutations of the virus requiring a deviation from the solution that we had. If things remain the same, with the same, the same virus and the same vaccine, by the end of the year, a lot of this would be, would be behind us. And of course, we are anxiously awaiting a situation where we can open our border and open up the country. We have been opening up slowly. Only yesterday we approved people going out on the beaches, a simple, normal, mundane thing like going on the beaches to protect the turtles. We approved that yesterday and a lot of people were happy. We are anxiously awaiting a lot of our younger children coming out of school in a few weeks immediately after Easter. We are looking to see how much we can do bit by bit. I know some people are anxious, but it is that anxiety or an unwillingness to pay the low price that causes a lot of people to pay the high price. Please, people of Trinidad and Tobago, that high price of a lockdown, let us avoid that bill being presented to us. We cannot pay it. A little more patience, a little more patience. The vaccines will be with us because with all that's happening now. I mean, this evening I, I met with the, the, uh, the British High Commissioner here. And as head of CARICOM, we've done all that we're doing in CARICOM to speak directly to our colleagues who have and who are in a position to help. And I have confidence that very soon something positive is going to happen because the world cannot inoculate itself in one corner while the virus is threatening to mutate in another corner. That makes no sense whatsoever. And therefore, all I'm asking the people of Trinidad and Tobago to do is to ignore the lies, ignore the advice from the advisors who were wrong in the beginning, they were wrong in the middle, and they could be wrong in the end. Just a little patience and rely, as I am doing, I am relying on the professionalism of the health department of Trinidad and Tobago who have taken us to where we are so far and the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. So at this stage, um, I would like to ask the Minister of Health to say a few words. And if you have, um, in fact, before he say a few words, we go to the floor in case you have any questions out there and we respond to the questions. Oh. And we save the best for last. After we get through, um, it's now by my watch is nine, it's 8.55. So we'll try and deal with COVAX and the vaccine and the virus until I would say 20 past nine the latest. And the rest of it will save for education and the scholarship system. Thank you very much. Questions from the floor now, if you have any, or from those who are sending them in from outside. Yes, Prime Minister, we have, and I hope I'm doing his name justice from, uh, by email, Nebot Marin asks, thank you for being candid and willing to answer questions. How come persons returning to the country after being vaccinated for COVID-19 and presenting a negative PCR test still have to quarantine at a government supervised facility Whereas people in the country who are confirmed COVID positive are allowed to quarantine at home with their family. Why aren't vaccinated COVID negative people allowed to quarantine at home? Sure. Um, I would like to ask the Minister of Health to answer that question. Sure. Thank you very, very much. Um, before I answer, on behalf of the constituency of St. Joseph, Prime Minister, welcome to St. Joseph. Could we give the Prime Minister of St. Joseph welcome? Good. So, in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19 amongst families, we have always adopted the safety first policy. And anyone coming into the country, the policy has always been to quarantine at a state facility or a state managed facility. 
Now, even though you have a negative PCR test and you are vaccinated, the vaccine does not guarantee 100%. You cannot transmit the disease, okay? What the vaccine does basically is make sure you don't get seriously ill or you don't have the opportunity to get into a hospital or an ICU setting. But even if you are vaccinated, you can still transmit the disease. So that is reason number one. Reason number two, out of a sense of safety again, and Professor Carrington, who comes to the press conferences very often, I will use her term, variants of concern. The variants which can come into the country if we allow these people to, qu to quarantine at home, if those variants get a foothold in your country, two things happen. You may have to lock down again, and as the Prime Minister said, we can't afford another one. Two, the vaccine program which we want to launch may be rendered somewhat ineffective because some of the research is showing that the efficacy of the vaccine is reduced when the variants get a foothold in the country. So out of an abundance of caution to protect us and to protect you, we have followed this clear path based on global evidence and based on the science. So I hope that answers the question, Ni Nigel. Right. Thank you. And we have another question online from Claudia Stewart. Dr. Rowley, you had a meeting with the President of China, Xi Jinping, earlier this week. Did you discuss the possibility of attaining COVID-19 vaccines, vaccines from China, and then perhaps push this vaccine to be approved by the World Health Organization as CARICOM chair? Okay, first, we have absolutely no influence to push the vaccine to be approved. In fact, we don't want vaccines that are approved by politicians pushing it. It is the scientists and the doctors who must tell us that the vaccine is okay. And the first part of the question, yes, I did talk to President Jinping about the possibility of getting vaccines from China, Sinopharm, which is one of the labels you've been hearing about, but making it quite clear that um, we would only accept and use a vaccine that has been certified as approved for human use by the WHO. As soon as Sinopharm gets that approval, if it ever gets it, Trinidad and Tobago would be in a position to um, access that source, among others. Because as I mentioned earlier on, the COVAX only covers 20%. We have to look for the other 80% elsewhere. And that is one of the possible areas. President Jin, President Jin um, Ping has promised that once um, we are prepared to use a Chinese vaccine, China would be able to help Trinidad and Tobago. So it's just the approval that stands between us and that kind of vaccine. So let me just um, follow up on the Honorable Prime Minister. The Sinopharm vaccine, phase three clinical data, is going before WHO as we speak. And all, and I always say, all things being equal, if all things go according to plan, the Sinopharm vaccine should get emergency youth authorization or emergency use license, hopefully by the end of March. I could also add that the Ministry of Health has signed a non-disclosure agreement with Sinopharm. That's another hurdle we have crossed. So we are in the game with Sinopharm once the vaccine becomes WHO approved. We have signed off on the non-disclosure agreement with Sinopharm on Monday. All right, we now have a question from the floor. Please state your name and come here. Hi, good evening, everyone. Afia Joyo Coppin from St. Joseph Constituency. Prime Minister, you mentioned that some children will be returning to school after Easter. Can you share any more details on that? Well, I get my information from a certain person who is here. <laughs> so if that person is to tell us what she's told the cabinet or the prime minister, tell the country. Are you ready now? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. On April the 12th, we anticipate that once our numbers hold, and we have been doing quite a good job at that, so we anticipate we would be able to, the standard five students would be able to come back to school. 
So on February the 8th, we had the Forms 4 to 6 coming out. And so on April the 12th, we anticipate the Standard 5. So we are really focusing on the exam students to ensure that their preparation is done. And on that theme, we have another question from the internet, from Stacey Mary. With all respect due to the complicated nature of this pandemic, it feels as though the education of our children in this country has been forgotten. What is the plan for the reopening of schools and preschools given our low rates of COVID-19 contraction and even lower hospitalization rate? And the fact that shops, restaurants, casinos are all operating. When can daycares reopen to allow women in TNT to return to their work? I think it is um, it's hard to accept the assertion that education has been forgotten. If we look at the very hard work that was done since March of 2020, up until now by the teachers, the parents, and the students themselves, who have really been pushing the envelope in a difficult and challenging time to ensure that education takes place. And, and, and let me really salute that hard work. So in September of 2020, understanding that we could not reopen physical school as we would have hoped, virtual school was started and that started countrywide. And so what has happened from that time, teacher training has been going on from since March of 2020, that is still ongoing. So teachers have been continuously trained in online delivery from that time. We've also introduced training for parents and students this term in response to the demand coming in. In term one of 2020-21, which would have been September 2020 until December, our students were fully engaged. And those who could not be online, the package system was instituted. And I can tell you that in many schools, because of the nature of the parents, the culture of the school, that has also been quite successful in some schools, not saying generally. However, the package system was instituted. We have done lessons online. We have done lessons on TV4 on a 24-hour basis, and I want to thank TTT for their partnership in this regard. We have done radio sessions, and that's still ongoing. Every Sunday, there is a pullout for the ECCE in the print media. So there have been multiple avenues, not just virtual, for those who could not be online. And of course, let me not um, forget to note and to congratulate our corporate citizens who have pledged 22,000 devices, over 22,000, and delivered over 18,000 of those to our students. So education has not been forgotten. It is a global challenge. It is something that um, every education sector has been grappling with. But in the words of the Prime Minister, let us not sell ourselves short. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have been able to continue schools virtually, help those who were not able to get onto the virtual platform by providing devices and connectivity, as well as providing content and information. And we have taken the very wonderful and brave step of reopening schools partially, and we aim to do more of that because of our expert handling of the pandemic. And that is the number one priority that has been identified by the UN as necessary for countries. And some of our regional neighbors they are not in this position now, and they are aiming to be able to open back their schools. So we are, of course, in the throes of the challenge, but we have been fighting manfully. And if I dare say, we have been fighting well and dealing with it thus far. The challenge remains, but we are doing human service to our children. This, this, might, be a good, this might be a good point for me to mention that among the people that we have stood with, Maybe not as much as some people think we ought to have done, but we have found some support for our artists, and some of them have been doing human service in engaging this whole experience. See that painting? What do you see there? Teach about. What you see there is a pensive person who is either a child or a teacher, but I think, it's a, I think it's a student. Because the name of that painting is Better Live Dunce Than Dead Bright. 
Do you see the that painting? That's one of our foremost artists, Sean Peters, a student of Leroy Clark, who has painted, and this painting captures the sense of what we have been involved in. First and foremost, the preservation of life. So he says, better I live dunce than come out there, try to, try to be bright, get the virus and die. So this painting says, better live dunce than dead bright. So that's how the artists have captured it for us. Um, any other question? Yes, Prime, Prime Minister, if I could just support um, Minister Nyan Gatsby Dolly, because he questioned us about preschools. Preschools? Yes, mm -hmm. and why preschools are still, are still daycare, closed so. and daycare. So, so let me try to explain why. Um, children pose a particular challenge with COVID-19 for two reasons. One, they tend to be asymptomatic carriers. And if they live with elderly parents or grandparents, they can pass on the virus to their parents or grandparents where the bulk of fatalities would lie. And two, you would have heard Dr. Joanne Paul, who I bring on to the press conferences very often. She's a pediatrician, and she's my point person for pediatrics. And she would have explained to the country many times, and I had to answer a question in the Senate, about multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, shortened Miss C. So far in Trinidad and Tobago, we have had 21 cases of Missy, which means COVID inflames all the systems in a child, brain, heart, liver, blood system. And she made the point in the Caribbean, it is to be found mainly in the Afro population and the mixed population. There seems to be a genetic um, component to it. The fact is, we have not lost one child yet to Missy. Not lost one. And one of the reasons for that, it's because preschools and daycares are still closed. We are still in the throes of a pandemic, right? So the science tells us we need to protect our children for two reasons. One, they tend to be asymptomatic carriers will infect their parents, grandparents, and they die. And two, we want to prevent Missy, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, of which we have had 21 to date with no fatalities. Thank you very much, Nigel. We now recognize the question on the floor. Good evening to the panel. Master Chanpak is my name. My question is addressed to you, Madam Minister. It has been said that there are going to be changes in the awarding of scholarships and bursaries. Can you enlighten us on these changes and what criteria are going to be used to qualify for these? Thank you. In November of 2020, that was when we would have signaled as a government that changes would have had to be made in GATE scholarships and we were introducing the national bursaries. So previously, 2019, let's use that as an example, there were 400 scholarships awarded, national scholarships, based on your performance at KEEP only. Those scholarships are awarded in 10 cognate groups or subject groupings, for example, information and communication technology, natural sciences, mathematics, business, etc. So that is what obtained up to 2019. In 2020, what the government did, recognizing our situation and recognizing, one, that the expenditure on scholarships was not something that could be maintained in the current climate. In addition to that, recognizing that the investment in post-secondary education, that has been something going on since 1962. That investment could be channeled in a more focused and strategic way to help those who need it most and to ensure that the money goes into training persons that are doing such studies that are critical for our national development. So recognizing that, the government moved to a system where we would still recognize our highest performers, and we would do that by awarding 10 scholarships in every subject area, every cognate grouping. 10 of the highest performers would get that, 10 highest performers. And then 
we would open up 500, the opportunity for our nationals to apply for up to 500 bursaries for the year. So the combination of 500 bursaries and the 100 scholarships gives the government the opportunity to help 600 young people rather than 400 at an estimated cost of 81 million less annually. So it fits the bill of being more affordable for the government in a difficult time, and the Minister of Finance has gone to great lengths over and over to explain our difficulties exacerbated by COVID-19, and it allows the government to help more young people, and it allows us to focus on the areas where we have the need developmentally, and it allows us to help those who need it most. So in all areas, it really is a win-win type situation. Of course, the bursaries are different. They, are not, um, they were never existing before. So the population naturally would need to understand the difference between them. And so we have opened the applications to the National Bursary after having awarded the 100 scholarships. And we want to congratulate all of the scholarship winners. And we know that there are many other excellent performers. And we want to encourage them to apply for the National Bursary applications are open. They open on March 15th and will close on April the 12th. And the bursary application, one you have to apply, it's applying online, and uh, the ministry's website and social media pages can give directions as to where you access the form. In addition to that, I just want the public to know and to understand, as was said before, that your bursary application depends on your academic qualifications, as you would have gotten in Cape, it also depends on your need, so you have to complete the means test. It depends on your um, extracurricular and community activity, because you want to encourage persons that are giving back and participating in their community. It also um, requires you to do a purpose statement so that we see and understand where you see yourself contributing to the country. And so all of this ties into your bursary application. You make that application online, and that will be assessed by a combination of the scholarships division of the ministry, by the GATE division, which deals with the means test, and by the scholarship selection committee, which is a body that has existed since 1972, and that usually does all of the um, evaluations for scholarships that are offered, say, by the, the government of China, the government of India, that is the body that usually accepts those applications, and therefore that body is very experienced in going through those types of applications and so on, and making the assessment. So the whole process, yes, it is new, but we get the opportunity to help more young people. In addition to that, the policy, the guidelines and procedures and frequently asked questions are available on the website as well. So students who are applying for the bursary can make themselves um, aware of everything that goes along with it, all of the requirements, and so they have the opportunity to transparently know what they're entering into and make their applications. And I want to encourage all of our excellent performers to please make use of the opportunity that the government is affording at great sacrifice because this government of Trinidad and Tobago has always seen it important to invest in our young people and to ensure that we offer these incentives so that our young people can succeed. The National Bursary goes, um, gives you paid full tuition, 100% tuition, as well as a book allowance and a monthly allowance for your upkeep. So it is very much like an additional scholarship and it applies to your study here in Trinidad and Tobago or in the region. And so we are encouraging our young people to apply for this opportunity. It is the first time we are able to assist so many young people, as many as 600, because the maximum in the past was 447. So it really is a wonderful thing. Let me floor, please give your name and community. Yeah. Okay. Hello, good night. My name is Emerson John Charles. I am from Pitibug, Sawa. Um, UE St. Augustine is well respected for its research and development in the area of agriculture, cocoa in particular, and I know UTT um, was so successful, successful in their areas of research that they recently got some patents. As we have a situation where these big countries are cornering, cornering the COVID, the vaccine market, are there plans to finance or support or partner with anyone 
to have research and development in the relevant medical areas so we won't have such a situation facing us in the future? I don't think it's as simple as that eh? because um, yes, we do have some connections, some of our technical people, some of our professionals are part of the overall monitoring and examining of the virus and its movement and its progress and its challenge, and they share their information with their scientific colleagues and so on. But the whole idea of us setting out to invest in the kind of infrastructure that will build something and keep it there to produce vaccines for you um, if and when you need it. It may make more sense to be part of a wider world scene where um, you share scientific work than have to have your own infrastructure. Because basically, we are a very, very small country. And there are countries that are times larger than us who don't have that kind of infrastructure. Because this kind of situation doesn't come every day to give you the kind of business you think you'll have. And, but of course, it's being said that we are to expect more and more of this kind of, because the more we interact with viral pools in other populations of living things, we can expect that this kind of situation would not be few and far between. But our people at UWI and other institutions, maybe UTTM probably, but certainly UWI, you would have seen some of them, um, like Dr. Carrington. Christine. Dr. Carrington. Christine. Dr. Carrington. Um, she was, actually she's my cousin. And when, when, she was, when she was going to study virology, I was one of those who kind of, what? <laughs> but look at what happened today. She is here providing us with leading edge. Um, responses, and I'm sure there are many other people in the system um, who have, so we can, at that level, we can participate, but in terms of building out the infrastructure, say, okay, all right, there's a pandemic on, and we can start to produce our own vaccines. Now, I don't think we're going to be there in the very near future. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, good evening. Ariane Fraser from Mount Lambert. Um, over the last year, numerous persons have suffered from mental health issues in the pandemic, including depression and anxiety. Can you tell us what measures have been put, are put, being put in place to address this? We don't have any doctors on, on the panel. Eh? The closest we've come, and we are going to come, is um, the Minister of Health, who has been around doctors for a long time. <laughs> so I will ask him to try and answer Thank that you. question. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Marianne, for the question. So again, I rely on expertise. What I do, I surround myself with experts and I manage the system. So Dr. Hazel Othello, who I, I took a note to Cabinet to create this post of National Director of Mental Health in charge of decentralizing of mental health. What we have done under her leadership and stewardship is started the process of decentralizing mental health so that persons with mental health issues from depression or whatever no longer have to rush to a central location like St. Anne's. So what we have done, we have set up satellite mental health clinics. So for instance, in Mount Hope, there's a walk-in clinic. In um, Takarigua, there's a full-time clinic. Barataria, instead of having a clinic one day a week, we have it three days a week. When we opened the new Digo Martin Health Center, we took the old one and dedicated that to mental health. So what we have done is put mental health back into the community, which is part of the decentralization process. So we have set up a series of mental health clinics under the auspices now of the RHAs. And that is working well. We also have phone-in sessions. And under each RHA, they have stress management clinics and so on. And to tell you how brilliantly this program of decentralization of mental health is going, I think it's, not, it's no longer a secret because I want to say it now. St. Anne's was typically our largest hospital in terms of bed numbers, a thousand. And you would have people in St. Anne's who only know St. Anne's as their home because they were institutionalized there for 30 and 40 years. 
and it rolls full chock a block. Since we started the decentralization process, you know what's the patient load at St. Anne's now? 750. Because we have taken mental health back into the community. So for depression, stress, and all that, we have decentralized this under each RHG, including walk-in clinics and so on. If I, if I may add, Prime Minister, just to add the perspective from the schools, because we do have quite a number of students who have been experiencing mental health challenges. You know, they are not in their usual environment. They are not able to socialize and so on. And so the school social workers and the guidance counselors received training so that they can deliver online. And so they are interacting with the students online. And now that we do have some students back out at school, they are also having face-to-face -face sessions and they're available. So that service for the students is still available and ongoing. And of course, the teachers are accessing the employees assistance program. And they reported that they're getting increased numbers as well. Um, and they are able to deal with teachers as they are ho at home and so on. They have been seeing more teachers reaching out to them. So that's available for the teachers. Here's an interesting question from the Yacht Services Association. Are there any considerations in the pipeline to help save the jobs, livelihoods, and businesses in the yacht services industry? As the industry has been shut down since March last year and has been earning no income. Just to add, maritime quarantine practices have been going on for hundreds of years. At present, other Caribbean islands have been accommodating yachts and have had no reported cases of COVID from the yachting community. Our yachting industry is now at the brink of collapse. Well, the answer is yes, there's consideration because we won't want a uh, contributory part of our economy like that to collapse. Um, you may recall that as we came back out from the lockdown, what we tried to do was to bring out more and more people. Um, some areas um, were not selected as the group of people to come out. And um, as we get a little more confident, um, we, I'm, I'm sure that all things being equal and if we are able to sustain the progress we've made in the not too distant future, we should be able to do something about the population of people who are around the yacht business. And also, because they are incomers in the Trinidad and Tobago, we have to be particularly careful with them at an earlier time, and we still are. But I think very soon we might be able to um, begin to relax the restrictions there because of the sustained that we are having. Thank you, Prime Minister. We now acknowledge question from the floor. Give your name and community, please. Yes. Esmond Ford, Member of Parliament, Tunapuna. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a young constituent of mine, uh, a practicing doctor, Dr. Colin Alexander, just texted me and said that she went through the schedule of the health facilities that will be given the COVID-19 vaccinations, and she noticed that the El Dorado Health Facility on El Dorado Road and the Mokoya Health Facility in Mokoya are not on the schedule. The nearest ones will be the one in St. Joseph and also the next in the further east will be the one in Arima. Again, in going forward, would those two facilities be added to the schedule or what arrangement can be made in order to facilitate? Okay, so the choice of facilities, we have chosen 21 so far. The choice of facilities, I have a team and we have criteria. It has to do with, one, the amount of parking space you have. Then when we go inside, the ability of the health center to accommodate a particular pedestrian patient flow. Two, because we are being very careful in the early stages, each health center we choose must have resuscitation equipment, resuscitation space. Three, they must have the necessary spatial arrangement to make sure we don't have congregation. So those are the list of some of the criteria we look at. Not every health center will fit the bill, right? So that is what we are doing right now. And the 21 we, that we have selected, um, three in Tobago, four in e ERHA, I believe um, eight down in south and the rest between North Central and Northwest. Those 21 have fit the bill so far. What is very important in the early stages of the vaccination program, the health centers we choose must have resuscitation equipment, resuscitation space, because what you don't want is one person 
in the first 10 minutes with a bad reaction, and then the whole vaccination plan crashes. So we are going very careful and steady, and as we get more custom to it, then it is possible to add more, right? So that's the criteria we use so far. Prime Minister Aaron Pollard asks, he's the manager of the Trinidad Tobago Volleyball Federation. Right now, only national players 16 years and above can train with the national team in team sports. Can this age be reduced to 14 using the same COVID-19 and social distancing protocols that are in place? Well, that advice that you heard earlier on about young people, um, having a propensity to be carrying the virus without showing any symptoms um, would have caused us to draw a line somewhere to keep the young people safe and as well as not having them. So the line of 16 was drawn and as the same way we're talking about bringing out um, primary school students after Easter, as long as the situation remains stable or within our um, low risk zone we would keep adding. So that should hold out some hope for us to add as we go forward, 14 year olds. Nardesh Maraj asks, what are your reasons for not allowing restaurants to serve alcohol when dining in? The restaurants are observing all COVID protocols and are not allowed to sell alcohol, which contributes to their business growth and therefore economic activity. We are the only country that is doing this. Oh, larger, really? <laughs> larger countries and states, example New York, allow for dining outdoor and indoor with alcohol consumption in a responsible manner. Well, I would have thought that um, alcohol would have been known to everybody to be uh, the liberalizer. What has happened with, um, is that what we have observed here in Trinidad and Tobago and elsewhere is that where alcohol is being consumed, people become um, less responsible and because we are putting a premium on responsible conduct at the very personal level down to the family size out for dinner we are ensuring that alcohol doesn't play a role in any behavior that allows us to suffer some people might think we're overreacting but so be it for now there are those who did not do it. And the consequences are grave. Let us not believe that, oh, it's only at beer, it's only at dinner. One person shot down a big city. One person was infected and went to a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, a big city with millions of people had to be shut down because it only takes one infected person. Started. So it is the reason to answer the question is because we know that when alcohol is being consumed, people drop their guard and become less responsible. And because responsible conduct is required at this stage, we hold it for a little while longer. Nigel, let me just support what the Prime Minister is saying by giving you two sets of numbers briefly. You would have heard us say on the press conference in County Carney which is of particular concern now. One case of COVID-19 in County Carony spawned 34 contacts. It means 34 people associated with one person had to quarantine. That is how fast this thing can turn on its head. The other number we need to understand, and the epidemiologist will tell you, for every 30 cases we clock in Trinidad, Based on our case fatality ratio, one person will die. Let that sink in for a moment. We are doing well. Remember two days ago we got 17 cases? For every 30 cases we will get, a person will die. That is what the numbers have told us so far. So we still have to be careful and we still have to realize we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Thank you very much, Nigel. Andre. <laughs> Andre, sorry, I keep calling you Nigel, sorry. Uh, Stephen Lucio asks, as a prime minister and as a citizen, were you scared of the pandemic's effects on our country? Were? Well, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared every day. I wake up every morning 
with a prayer that tomorrow would be better than yesterday, but I am, you know, preparing to, to receive bad news. This is not something that you can say, okay, well, it's over. When it's over, I'll stop being scared. But right now, I'm afraid that our country, like other countries, could suffer a reversal. And I'm scared of that. Curtis Louis asks, why can't the country be opened back up or at least extend business hours from 10 p.m. to 12 to allow the local economy to get a boost? Um, well, again, in the context of, for, for the errors that are stopped at 10 o'clock, the reason for that is the more people are close together, and the longer they stay close together, the better your chances of spreading the infection. So what we do, we limit the space by physical distancing, and we limit the exposure by the number of hours you have mass, mass outings. So that's the main reason. That is the reason why we stop it at a particular time. Because if, if, if the whole country is out 24 hours, then more people are out longer, and the chances of the fire spreading Whereas if less people are out longer, then you, that is your way of, our way of trying to reduce the exposure and the risk. We have some more questions. Stephen Lucio also asks, with vaccination being a topic of hot discussion, will the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago accept offers of vaccination from Russia as well? Well, as long as the Russians are offering WHO-approved vaccines, we will consider that. But if it's not WHO-approved, we will not accept it to be used in Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to repeat that again. We are only going to vaccinate the people of Trinidad and Tobago with a product that has got the sanction of the World Health Organization. We're not going to experiment here. Yes. Are there any further questions forthcoming? I would like to ask one oh. in regard to community residences under the auspices of the Children's Authority and what was the thinking behind the limits to persons living in community because those numbers tended to exceed 10 when the public health regulations required a limit of 10 persons. But you had up to 20 people up to 60 children, I guess in some homes, like St. Jude. So could you give us some explanation of how, uh, what the thinking was in terms of the safety and the protocols for community residences? So the, the regulations speak to 10 people in public. So in public, you could have 10 people gathering. Um, what you do in your private setting is a bit different. And you know, we've had this debate about public versus pri private. Um, at, since we have a little time, it appears as though we um, are running out of questions. I want to just alert you to one area of this vaccine story that is um, it's coming your way, and that is the role of the private sector in the supply of vaccines, both to the public sector and to the private sector. Because the conversation has already begun that the government has not done what it could have done and move swiftly enough to get vaccines. And therefore, if the private sector was involved, they would have done better. Well, we've seen in one of the newspapers one day a front page story about the tardiness, I think that was the word used, tardiness of the government in getting vaccines, even though I just explained to you that the vaccines were never available for us to get. And then, of course, you would have seen, or by now, or you would have seen a publication where one conglomerate has taken initiative to vaccinate its workers. And I've seen congratulations from certain political quarters that, yeah, this is what it should be. But the question that we have to ask, and which I am asking, and I think Minister of Health is asking, where is that vaccine going to come from? Because only certain sites are authorized to produce vaccines to get WHO approval, 
and only those companies that are already known to us that have vaccines, which will not sell to a sovereign government. And the question is, if the local private sector is saying we can get vaccines, then of course, if it is good vaccine with all the pedigree identified and so on, then maybe they're better than the government. As of now, I have not seen that anywhere in the region where the private sector has been able to get vaccine and the government has not been able to get. I've seen many offers of people saying, I have access to vaccines and I can get some for you. But of course, when you drill down into it, you realize that you're on a slippery slope here. One conglomerate offered the government, I think it was a gift, of a large amount of vaccines. Or initially, I think this was early in February, the offer was made that they will um, help us get vaccines. But the conditions were such that the government would have had to provide to this company eight million US dollars to get the vaccines. Good, well maybe a corporate Trinidad and Tobago entity can do what the government can do. Of course, in many instances that is so. I'm not so it is so now. But then we had to turn down that offer because it carried with it a request for a tax write-off to that action and the write-off to take place in 2021. Meaning that this involvement with the government to get vaccine, this company would have cornered a large amount of US dollars to do what the government should be doing because they had already published many stories to portray the government as not being able to do what you're supposed to do. And they will get the vaccine for you. And for that wonderful philanthropy, the taxes that they were due to pay this year, an equivalent amount would be written off by them and any other company that does that for the country. Well, of course, the government had to turn that down. And of course, a month later, we got another, another initiative, which I think is still current, because, and you'll see it um, being published because these people have entities that publish and, and educate you and miseducate you. The latest offer in front of us is that a local Trinidad conglomerate has access to a million vaccines. I don't know where they're getting it from because I just told you and I tell you up front that this government has nothing to hide contrary to what you're hearing. We cannot find vaccines to buy. If a local company has access to a million vaccines, more power to them. They've offered to give the government 50,000 for free, for the public, at least 950,000. They've offered to use 50,000 for the staff. And 6,000 for the staff. Yeah, whatever it is. But the bottom line is, the rest of it is for sale. What they're not telling you, or what you don't know, is that in the event that there is any truth to that, or any realization to that offer, whoever is supplying that vaccine, if it is coming from one of the authorized suppliers, as the minister will tell you, when they tell you the price, they also hold you to a confidentiality clause, meaning you must not tell anybody what you pay. And I presume the same thing will apply to a local conglomerate buying a million vaccines. And then, of course, if then the excess in that million is for sale, as the offer is, we have no idea then the relationship between the price that it will be sold at in Trinidad and Tobago and what it was paid, what was paid for, because the seller puts a confidentiality clause, and the only price you will know is the price charge here. And of course. I tell you this so that you would know, because I have every reason to believe that you will read it in the newspapers or see it on the television and hear it on the radio. But you will hear it in the context that the government is not doing its job and we are doing it for you. And of course, I see congratulations already going out for that. But as Prime Minister of this country, I don't know the source, but I think the minister has asked the, yeah. the, the pertinent question, what is the source of this vaccine and who is the, the agent? agent? Yeah. Because we 
at the level of the government, we are only not ordinary by virtue of the responsibility we carry for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And if vaccines are available to the private sector, coming from WHO authorized sources, and they can come in through the normal protocol of drugs coming into this country, well, then the private sector would be in a position to provide vaccines, and in which case, there's no problem. But if, on the other hand, it is the same place that we are going looking for vaccines, or that there are vaccines that we have question marks over because the risk of providing dangerous drugs to the citizenry is not only in COVID time, that's a 24 seven exercise at the Ministry of Health to protect the population. So when you see it, you would have heard it from me because all of these are things that are going on right now. And of course there are those who would have a different perspective to the government, but I also tell you, they have a different responsibility. Um, Prime Minister, if I might just support what you were saying, because I want the country to understand that we must not sacrifice safety for expediency with this vaccine thing. Let me give you an example. Bringing in vaccines which have to be stored and maintain the cold chain from manufacturer to your arm. If we purchase even a WHO approved vaccine from a third party, I have to be sure that the integrity of the cold chain has been maintained. Because if it has not, and that third party did not store it in proper conditions and the vaccine degrades, what happens when I as minister advise the government to buy vaccines I am unsure of the storage conditions. I have no evidence that the cold chain has been maintained. The vaccine degrades. I inject it into someone, and heaven forbid, that person dies. The vaccination plan that the government has is a careful one based on your safety, your health. And as Minister of Health, I give you the assurance I will not go for expediency over safety. Better be safe than sorry. So, Prime Minister, we have just over 15 minutes left. Andre asks, will the government consider stepping up efforts to educate the population about vaccines and how they work? Yes, I think the Ministry of Health is doing that and should do more yes. yeah. because a vaccine is not magic. It can be explained to even the child. Yeah. So I think now that we are in the vaccine phase of our experience in the pandemic, that's a very yeah. useful thing to do. And I expect that the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Communication will play a role in the weeks and months ahead. Correct. Mustak Mohammed asks, is there any plan to vaccinate Olympic athletes and officials to be able to participate in the Olympic Games? Well, since we, don't, we as a country, since we don't have the vaccine, um, we can't say yes, but I'm sure by the time they're ready to go, um, all things being equal, we should yeah. be able to have vaccines. And certainly, um, those um, athletes who would like to be vaccinated should be able to be vaccinated here. And I, I'm not sure what is required in the Olympic Village. Well, Prime Minister, I've, I've been following that. I think a precondition is that the athletes and everyone else, um, officials, have to be vaccinated. I, I, yeah. I, would, I would expect so, so because that's where one of the areas that... Um, so we, we will make the necessary arrangements once we have the vaccine. Here comes another question. Christian asks, what is the point of taking the vaccine if it doesn't prevent you from getting the virus or transmitting it? Oh, and, and that's what you just said, the education about yeah. the vaccine. <laughs> the vaccine is not a cure. Vaccination is not a cure. When you vaccinate a child for all the little things you vaccinate them for, and not little things, all the things you vaccinate them for, you don't cure them. What you do, what the vaccine does, it introduces into the body 
uh, an item which causes the body to react in a particular way. And what it is, you introduce inside a, a, a dead piece of, yeah. the, of the virus, the body sees it and reacts by producing a destroyer to that. So that if later on you come in face to face or you, are in, you are ingest or uh, inhale or whatever you do, to the real virus, your body has the preparation to deal with it. It's a preparation. So I think that is the kind of education that needs to be had as to what vaccination is. It's a preparation of, of the body by al al alerting it to the requirement to build resistance to this thing in the event that this thing comes into your body. Right? So if, 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 you, if you don't see the vaccine as a cure and see it as a defense mechanism, a defender, you're, defend, you're preparing to defend yourself as against curing yourself from something that, is, that has happened already. Minister Gatsby Dolly, a young person asks, when schools reopen for preparatory school to join the current form four of the six, will the capacity limits for public transport also increase? When schools open? When schools reopen for standard five or preparatory school to join the current forms four to six, would the capacity limits for public transport increase? Well, it, I don't think the two are quite linked in that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that question is better posed to the Minister of Health because the capacity for transport yeah, is linked yeah. to the social distancing to okay. maintain our... So, so right now, public transport is limited based on the number of windows in a particular type of taxi or whatever. But I, as the Prime Minister said, all of these things are constantly under review. And once our numbers are good, in the typical review process, we will look at it. Yeah? Has the government considered drive-through vaccination sites? Can we pre-register or register online? This yeah. question comes from Christian. Okay. So the issue of drive-through um, vaccination sites is something we have looked at. Um, you may recall when I was asked, uh, responded to the question that um, MP Ford asked. In the first phase of our vaccination program, we are going to be very careful. We want to make sure, following WHO procedures, that anybody who gets a vaccine should be monitored for 15 to 30 minutes after being vaccinated. The current data says that for the rare side effects, they normally show within 10 minutes, anaphylactic shock, low blood pressure, or whatever. So right now, we are only choosing those vaccination sites where we can monitor you for 15 to 30 minutes. Once we have a body of experience, it is then possible to be a little more adventurous with our vaccination program and then look at drive-through sites as other countries are doing. But we want to be very careful in the first phase of our, of our vaccination program. Prime Minister, there are about 10 minutes left. I don't know if you want to use this opportunity to wrap up. Well, I didn't think that I'll end up in a situation where we have time and no questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to pass. I would like to. I would like to leave the floor open, and um, you know. But in, in the meantime, while you're getting your courage up or getting your questions in from outside, we can talk a little bit about the effect of the vaccine on the economy. We have the Minister of Finance here. Come talk. <laughs> yeah, use the mic. Use, use, oh, use the mic there. Use, use the mic there. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Did yeah. you take, 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 the, take, the, take the mask off because it's all muffled there. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. I should have followed Minister Sinanan and escaped through the side door <laughs> <laughs> about half an hour ago. <laughs> I caught him. <laughs> well, the virus has affected the economy in many different ways, many, many different ways. The public health restrictions in particular have affected so many um, areas of business activity. 
it's affected small business in particular. We did spend a lot of money last year. Last time I checked, it was actually closer to $18 billion. 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 $18 billion that we spent last year making sure that cash flow continued in the public sector, in the private sector, and so on. We don't have $18 billion this year, unfortunately. What we have to do, I mean, I, that question about the yachting sector, for example, I think I get an email from the yachties every two weeks. So I must have got a hundred so far. And that is an example of what can we do about a situation like that? Because the concern is how do we prevent the introduction of virus into the country? Now, I have advocated for trying to open up as many sectors as possible, but I've stayed in my section and I've stayed with finance. What we have to do as a country now is we have to find new ways and means of initiating business activity. There's a lot of talk about the public debt, for example, but when you're in a situation like this, if you look all over the world, you look at the United Kingdom, you look at America, Joe Biden, for example, he just had a two billion, sorry, two trillion, two trillion, sorry. Those numbers don't make any sense in the Trinidadian context. A 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus package. Now, United States has what is called a reserve currency. In other words, everybody wants US dollars. So there's no question of a devaluation of the US dollar per se. It moves up and down with other reserve currencies, like the pound, the yen, the euro, and so on. But everybody wants it. So the President of the United States can go to Congress and ask Congress to agree to print $2 trillion, which is what they've done. They've just simply increased the amount of, of money in the system by simply passing a law, passing a bill. We can't do that. Our currency is not exchangeable in the rest of the world. Nobody in the UK, for example, wants to, con to, to acquire Trinidad and Tobago dollars. So we face a particular problem. Because we can't print money, we have to find other ways of dealing with this. And the way we have dealt with it as a government, we're very fortunate we have a Heritage and Stabilization Fund, which somehow, over the last five and a half years, we have managed to maintain the same value in that fund as when we came into office in September 2015. I am always very surprised at this. When we came into office, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund was at 5.6 billion US. It's now at 5.7 billion US dollars. And we have used almost 1.5 billion or more out of that fund in the period. That's what we have to do. We're very fortunate that we have such a fund. But like all the rest of the countries in the world, we have to borrow. And what that is doing is it's putting pressure on our public debt, putting pressure on our debt service, putting pressure on our debt to GDP ratio. But what the virus has done is simply suppressed business activity. If I could put it in its simplest terms, it has shut things down. And that's only understandable. And then you have other problems that our businesses face. Shortages of foreign exchange because our commodities that we depend on, oil and gas, gas prices are down, gas production is down, and that is the major source of foreign exchange for the government, which we put back into the commercial banking system. So problems with foreign exchange, problems with revenue. So we have to borrow. This is no different to other countries in the world. The United Kingdom, for example, has borrowed, uh, the figure is astonishing, 500 billion pounds in the last 12 months. That is 5 trillion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. 5 trillion, 5,000 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. It's amazing, but they've done it because they have a reserve currency, so they could do that. You could simply print more pounds. And 
the other currencies will just go up and down around the UK pound. So our greatest problem now, in order to stimulate growth, we must spend. There's a lot of talk outside of there, don't spend. But if you don't spend, you suppress the economy, you crash the economy. How do we spend? We have to borrow. We have no choice. We have to borrow money, we have to dip into the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. So that is what the virus has done to our economy. It has suppressed activity, it has shut a lot of, shut a lot of activity down, and it has caused us to increase the public debt, and it has caused us to go into the Heritage Fund. But we have absolutely no choice as a country. I sit in the Ministry of Finance and I hear all sorts of things outside of there. I hear advice that we should reduce expenditure to match our income. If we were to do that, you're talking 15, 20 billion dollars cut. You know what a 15 billion dollar cut would do to our economy, Prime Minister? Thousands of people would lose their jobs. Thousands of businesses would close down. So um, I can't follow that advice. When people say, cut your expenditure to match your income, I can't do that. Others say, don't borrow. Well, if we don't borrow, where's the money going to come from? Because the pandemic has affected everyone, especially the energy sector. It has had a profound effect on the energy sector, but Trinidad and Tobago in particular. The major gas companies, the infrastructure that they need to keep production going, the platforms, the equipment, the machinery. It's not made in Trinidad and Tobago. BP, for example, is constructing platforms in Mexico. Mexico is on lockdown now for almost a year. So construction is shut down in Mexico. So the platform can't come to Trinidad to boost gas production. So gas production is down. That is just one example. So the way we have been affected by virus, we are small open economy, we are very sensitive to external factors, and all of these external factors have affected us severely. But we can't sit down and do anything. We must spend, we must try and get the productive sector going. We have to spend on things that create jobs like construction, housing, all of that. We must do it. And this is what we must, this is how it, we have been affected, we have been suppressed, and we have to grow again. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. And we have just uh, about three minutes left. Um, an interesting question came in from Kevin. Ministries and public institutions seem very hesitant to allow staff to work remotely, even staff with small children, with no daycare facilities. Is anything being done to encourage remote work? I think in the private sector, they've done as much as um, they could have done. In the public sector, it's not so easy because a lot of what public sector workers have to do, they have to do at the workplace. So working from home would only apply to the kind of job that can be done anywhere. If you're required to do something at a particular location, then you can't do it from home. And a lot of the public sector service um, involves um, being away from home to get that done. So in so far as we are able to, we are doing it, um, but not as anywhere near where we could have been doing it had we been more digital. And that is why, um, in fact, even before the pandemic came, we were working towards digitalization of this country. We have just recently signed an MOU with um, Estonia to um, help to get help to um, use their model in Trinidad and Tobago to build up this um, digitalization. And that is because oh, about two years ago or more, we started looking at this as a way to go. And the more the public service becomes digitalized, the easier it will be for such um, developments like working from home. And we have a ministry that is focusing on that now. And hopefully, in the not too distant future, a significant portion of the public service delivery can be done through digital usage. I am advised that we're extending time a little bit. Cecil asks, does the government see value in embarking on an education drive to encourage citizens to produce and buy local and support small community businesses in the economic climate? 
Um, it's desirable. Buy local is always desirable. There was a time when we had a major buy local campaign going on and it builds up a sense of pride in, your, in local products and it gives a lot of local participation. But over time, people's tastes and entitlement have been attached to a significant foreign input into their lives. You hear a lot about the food import bill and a lot of dismissive comments about why not reduce the food import bill. But when you look at it, the food import bill is tied to the taste on your plate. And of course, your, 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 your preference to go to a, an air conditioned outlet as against the village shop to your window and buy a package item that is imported probably, very fancy, very pretty, um, very tasty because it's full of salt and fat, not good for you at all. And, you know, we, even the, the, the standard produce, like say chicken, we import all the chicken feed, we import the eggs, we import the medicine, so we assemble it before it gets into the frying pan. So once our taste, once our taste does not change, we are going to be importing a lot of what we eat because even if we try to produce it here, the cost of production is higher than the cost of importation because those who produce it abroad, you're competing with that. They have huge economies of scale. So a pound of corn produced in Iowa could be sold to you at a fraction of the price of a pound of corn in Trinidad and Tobago. So yes, we grow some corn and we make some roast corn from fresh corn, fine. But the tons of corn required to feed the chickens, to produce the tens of thousands of pounds of, chi of chicken that you buy, is imported. So we still link our taste to that. Today my wife was laughing at me, asking me, you're eating your favorite again. It was, it's, it's um, um, Karaili. That's what I had today, Karaili and tomatoes, grown in my garden. So I did my bit to, the, to suppress the food import bill. <laughs> if, you had, if you had doubles, or if you had um, um, bas basmati rice, or if you had cornflakes, Kellogg's cornflakes imported from abroad, you are part of the problem. You like foreign things. <laughs> well, Prime Minister, we've come to the end of our time, so I give you the last closing word. Well, I simply want to thank the population for living up to what we expected, what we could do. When we started out on this journey to make the population take responsibility for the response to this virus, it was a gamble that has paid off. Some people think that we are a very indisciplined population, maybe we are, but on this matter of standing up in a pandemic and defending ourselves by individual responsibility by following the health protocols, we've done well. And I want to ask the population not to give up. We are almost there. The problems with the, with the vaccine is an international marketing problem. You would have seen in some instances where some countries have asked for permission to produce the vaccine by having the owners give up the patent. And in a pandemic, they said, no, we want to profit from our patent, even if you're gonna die like flies. That's the world we live in. And we just have to be careful, be responsible, and I have every confidence that my people of Trinidad and Tobago, all of us, will come out of this together and look back at this period as maybe our finest hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Ministers of Education and Health, other Ministers and Cabinet members and members of Parliament, uh, members of the Mount, Hope, Mount Lambert community, uh, radio listeners, media, online viewers, for your participation in conversations with the Prime Minister. On behalf of the Office of the Prime Minister, I am your moderator, Mark Andre Augustas, bidding you good night. Get home safely. Thank you. Thank you.